hey, it's really great to be here. Um, so I'm Piotr Solnica. Uh, my name is so weird because I come from Kraków. It's a beautiful city in Poland. Uh, if you've never been to Poland, it's real beautiful. So I invite you to come. We have some Ruby conferences as well. Uh, we have also beautiful mountains. So it's a really nice country. Um, so really quickly about me. Uh, I'm a Ruby developer. Uh, you can find some of my uh, open source projects on GitHub. Uh, and follow me on Twitter. I'm Solnik everywhere. Um, so if you wanted to say you had one job, I actually don't. I have three. Um, so I'm uh, part of a company called Powwow. It's a Polish Norwegian consultancy. Uh, I'm also working for Gitorius, uh, which is a, a Git hosting platform that you can host yourself. Uh, and by the way, we're moving to Docker. Uh, it's like 80% done. Uh, I'm also working for an Norwegian company called Evo, uh, which is uh, a chain of fitness clubs uh, with a huge infrastructure built in Rails. Um, so like before I start, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, like my, my experience as a Ruby developer so that you can uh, know where I'm coming from with all this stuff. Uh, so I started working as a Ruby developer seven years ago. Um, and in 2007, uh, we were mostly working on startups, right? So every project was Greenfield. Everything was really great, right? We were using Rails. Uh, we were writing a lot of Ruby code. And everything was smooth and just beautiful, right? Uh, but at some point, some of those startups actually succeeded, right? So suddenly, we started working on huge, uh, a couple of years old uh, Rails apps. And at some point, it became a problem, right? Uh, it started to be really difficult to maintain those projects. And I started to think, why is it so hard to maintain a big Rails application, right? What's the cause of this problem? And initially, I thought that, yeah, maybe we could use different patterns. Maybe we could uh, just use different libraries. Um, but really, what we've been doing for the last couple of years uh, seems to me like not solving the problem, but working around the problems that we have. And what I realized is that the cause of this problem is just complexity that we have. And all the tools that we are using are extremely convenient so that we can move really fast. Uh, but we don't think about the complexity that we pull in when we start depending on external pro uh, gems. So when we create a new Rails project, even if we don't include any additional gems, it's already a lot of complexity uh, that we have without even writing any, any code. So then we start to actually write some code, so we build even more complexity on top of already existing complexity, right? So it's something we don't think about on a daily basis. Um, so today I want to talk about convenience versus simplicity. And even though the title of this talk may seem to be a little bit abstract. Uh, I actually try to make it more concrete. Um, however, I'm going to start by, some, by explaining some of those uh, abstract terms. So uh, convenience. Um, when you look at a definition in dictionary, it says that uh, convenience is the state of being able to proceed with something without difficulty, right? And when you think about it, it's exactly what happens when we use uh, convenient tools like Rails. Uh, I'm not sure if you remember this one. Uh, this is from a screencast where DHH showed how to build a blog application in Rails in 15 minutes. It's pretty famous. You probably saw it. Uh, so this is, this is it. This is the convenience. All the things that we're not doing, all the things we're not thinking about, uh, we're just proceeding really quickly uh, with our tasks. We're accomplishing our goals really quickly without thinking much about the problems that, there, that we're actually dealing with. Uh, because a lot of those problems are solved by the libraries and frameworks that we are using. So on the other hand, we have simplicity. And again, when you look at the definition, it says simplicity is the quality or condition of being easy to understand or do. Uh, and it's a little bit tricky uh, because we often say that something is convenient and like immediately connect it with something that's simple. And it might be a little bit confusing because you see something that is simple, you think, okay, that's convenient, that's simple, I can simply just use it and it works. Uh, but you don't really think about what's inside, right? So 
what usually happens is that a lot of libraries and frameworks that are super convenient uh, and really simple to use uh, come with a lot of uh, internal complexity, uh, something that we just don't think about because we don't see it. So it's not our pro problem, right? Um, so when it comes to complexity uh, and ways of dealing with uh, the problem of complexity, uh, what programmers usually do uh, is to focus on uh, separation of concerns. Uh, if we have a huge problem, which is re really difficult to solve, we try to like split it into smaller pieces, into smaller problems, uh, and solve them individually. Um, and what I've noticed uh, in the Ruby ecosystem uh, that is probably ex inspired by, by Rails, uh, we often focus on convenience first. Uh, we often focus on all the fancy DSLs and the convenience that, that should come right from the start. Um, so when you look at, uh, for example, Active Record, right? Uh, it's a great uh, example of, of a convenient library. Uh, a, libra a library that solves a lot of different problems, problems that are really hard to solve, by the way. Uh, so when you look at uh, a basic model, a basic active record model, uh, it's just an empty class, right? And you might think that it's super simple, right? Because it's just a class. Uh, and you don't even have to write anything except defining the class to get a lot of functionality for free. Uh, if you want to create something uh, and persist it in the database, it's also very simple. Uh, just one method call, pass in params, and you're done. Um, even, wanna, if, if, even if you want to do something more fancy, like uh, find something, fetch something from the database, uh, load it in, into memory, and then do something with it, and save it back to the database, it's still super simple. You just call like three methods here, right? Um, so you might think it's also simple. Uh, I don't need to learn a lot. I'm, I'm just reading API documentation for like three minutes, and I know what to do. Uh, so you think, yeah, that's simple. Uh, and really, I don't think it's simple. Uh, and the reason why it's not simple is that there are a lot of things going on under the hood, and even though I don't see them, they do exist. Uh, and that's why I prefer to use the word convenient, uh, because it is also very convenient, but it is not simple. There is no simplicity here. Uh, there's a lot of internal complexity. It's just we don't see it. Um, when it comes to uh, separation of concerns, if we look at uh, this create method um, and think about what's actually going on, uh, we, re we will realize that we are dealing with things like uh, data coercion, which is a huge problem to solve, by the way. Uh, there are a lot of really nasty things uh, that you need to deal with uh, when you want to have coercion. Um, setting default values, this is also something that, that happens under the hood. You might not think about it, but it exists. Uh, we do things like validation, and validation is also a really big problem to solve. And eventually, uh, we, we do interact with the database, and interacting with the database is also a huge problem to solve, right? And this is like the basic stuff that, that, that happens under the hood. Uh, and if you're less lucky, uh, you could have things like business logic hidden in lifecycle hooks, all the before save, before validate, all this stuff. This is super complicated, and we do that. Uh, we also do things like handling nested data structures using um, accept nested attributes for, which is also a super complicated thing to deal with. Uh, we also do things like data normalization through custom attribute writers and plenty of other stuff. So this is a lot of complexity, and we tend to hide it in one place, uh, but it's just not a good thing to do. So when, you th when we want to talk about separation of concerns in this context, uh, we might look at it in a way where we can use separate objects to handle separate concerns. So what I tend to do these days is to process parameters uh, using a separate object, uh, validate things using a separate object, and handle persistence by a separ separate object as well. And whenever 
we talk about separating concerns and wh whenever we talk about using separate objects, there's always at least one person who would say something like, well, that's more complicated, right? I used to have one object, now I have three. And I don't think it's a good way of thinking about it uh, because separating concerns is actually something that leads to uh, simplicity. Even though you have more objects, uh, you still have better encapsulation and those objects are smaller and it's just easier to work with them. And one of the benefits that we have here is that we can always come up with a higher level abstraction, something that is more convenient and just encapsulate it and have just one method. And we have exactly the same convenience, but internally it is separated. Internally we have separ separate objects handling separate concerns. Uh, so this is like the benefit of, of, of separating concerns where you don't have to, you don't necessarily have to uh, be concerned about many things. Uh, you can have a system that is built on top of more primitive tools, but it could expose a very convenient interface. Uh, but once some of those concerns become your problem, once something is, is, is your concern, for example, uh, when, you, when you actually want to deal with coercion on, on your own or validation on your own, uh, you always have a, have a way of using a separate object. Uh, whereas in case of, of libraries like Active Record or many other gems written in Ruby where a lot of things are handled by, by just one thing, you just don't have that choice because there's no separate object, sep there are no separate objects that would handle separate things. So you just cannot use them separately. Um, so the next thing is uh, data and behavior. Uh, this is also an, an interesting subject because uh, uh, Ruby is an object-oriented language, obviously. Uh, so whenever we talk about object-oriented design, uh, we like to say things like, yeah, it's all about objects and sending messages, right? Or behavior. Uh, and I think that this whole movement with, with design-driven development, uh, we had a talk yesterday about it, uh, it is a nice way of thinking about software, but quite often it actually leads to uh, something that we could call um, accidental complexity. Uh, we may quite often introduce complexity that is not really needed uh, just because it feels like good to think about objects and the way they correspond to, I don't know, some real world uh, concepts. Like for example, if we have uh, an application, some kind of a system running and it it has users, right? So it's like natural for us to, to think about uh, having a user object because, well, it will, represent, it, it will represent a user of our system. So it feels like natural to, to, to uh, design our system like that. Um, but when, when we do this and when we focus on behavior so much, uh, we may often use objects that are simply too big. And it's also really, um, something really uh, uh, um, popular to do uh, in Ruby, and especially in Rails, uh, to use Active Record for everything. And as I said, if we have a user instance, uh, and we have users in the real world, and we want to have something like displaying full name, it feels natural to just add a method called full name because, well, our our users know their full names, so our object should know its full name, right? Uh, so we do that. But we, but we don't think about what's the actual requirement. And if, if our feature uh, is to, I don't know, display a list of users with their full names in some kind of a user interface, then the only thing that we need is the data and something really simple that knows how to display a full name or how to return a full name, right? So uh, what we do here is that we already have an object, we already have a model and it represents users. Uh, so it's just convenient to just, just put methods there, just, just expand its behavior, uh, because it feels natural. Uh, but what, I, what I'm usually doing these days is to just focus on the most basic stuff, uh, on what's really, really needed uh, for the system in order to work. Uh, so the data is really important. All we need is, is to just get the data and have some kind of an object that returns the full name. Uh, so it is like the essential part here to, to have just those two things in order to accomplish our task. Uh, this is obviously a very simple example, uh, but it like illustrates uh, the philosophy here. Uh, and you know, using this object is still very simple. So 
Um, this is pretty much what convenience is. Uh, this is like a, some kind of a crappy coffee maker, uh, but it's convenient, right? You just press a button and there goes coffee. Uh, but what I really prefer is this. This is V60. Uh, I had coffee here from V60. It was awesome. This is super, super simple, very basic tool, and it makes an awesome coffee. Uh, and this is pretty much the, sensor, the essential stuff. You focus on what's really, really important, and you reject everything else. Uh, I, would even, I would even say that sometimes it makes sense to be minimalistic. Uh, what, when, you're be, when, you are, when you are minimalistic, you're, you're just reducing complexity, uh, and you're just using just the thing that you need, and nothing else. So another interesting thing about data and behavior is immutability. Uh, which, which is also a little bit weird uh, since Ruby, again, it's an object-oriented language, so we are used to relying on mutable state. Uh, however, mutability is really something that can bite you and be very problematic. Uh, and here's a very simple example. Uh, so we have our, our presenter object. It receives some data hash. And the fact that this data hash can be changed by something else, something external, it can actually cause our presenter instance to just be broken. And this is absolutely terrible. It's just such a basic thing that we do, and it can break our code. I mean, what's the point of doing that? So really, when it comes to immutability, uh, when we're dealing with the data, I would really encourage you to just uh, think about make, making the data structures immutable. Um, in Ruby, we do that using freeze, right? Uh, unfortunately, if we have nested data structures, uh, like this data hash, uh, we might want to use some external tools, tools like uh, ICE9, which is a gem that gives you this crazy method called deep freeze, uh, which will actually uh, take this hash and freeze everything like deeply. Uh, so if, we tr if you try to change it in place, like mutate it in place, it will, uh, it will raise runti runtime error, right? Uh, this is a little bit crazy, obviously, in Ruby, um, but, and it's slow, and it's, it's actually really slow, uh, but for the data structures, uh, I'm actually using it, and it actually makes my code much more simpler, uh, and I feel more confident when, I, uh, when I'm relying on data structures that don't change. Uh, another interesting gem that you could use when it comes to uh, uh, immutability is adamantium, which is even more crazy. Uh, it is a gem that makes your objects immutable, uh, also by deep freezing them. Uh, so when it comes to freezing data structures, it's one thing, uh, but when it comes to freezing all your objects, uh, it's a completely different story. Uh, so I actually, started using adamantium a couple of years ago. Uh, initially, uh, when we were working on uh, Data Mapper 2, which is now called ROM, uh, we started uh, with uh, like a very clear separation uh, where, where we have commands and you have query methods. Uh, and it worked great, uh, but then Dan Kopp, um, maintainer of Data Mapper and, and also lead developer in ROM, uh, suggested that maybe we should try to make it more hardcore and uh, actually start to use immutable objects, like, all the time. So he created adamantium uh, to, like, enforce this style. Uh, and I got really intrigued by that, and I thought, well, this is a little bit crazy, but I'm gonna try, right? So I started doing that, and really, it was tough. It took me, like, a few months to just wrap my head around this concept and just change my style of, of writing code so that I will be creating objects that won't have to change. Uh, and initially I hated it, uh, but I really had this, like, this feeling that it will pay off. Like, at some point I will get it and it will, benef it will be beneficial. And it actually started to, to, to make sense at some point. And after a few months, uh, I noticed that my code is now way more simpler and I'm actually way more confident uh, with everything that I do because I don't have mutable state. Uh, so adamantium uh, works more or less like that. So if you have uh, a class 
and you include adamantium, uh, then you won't, won't be able to change uh, anything inside this, this object, the instance of this class. Uh, no, ma no matter how deeply you will go, uh, how deep you will go, um, it will raise an error, but it's super slow. It's extremely, extremely slow. Um, so under the hood, it's, it's using the, the ICE 9 jam that I showed you before. Um, but I would actually uh, like to encourage you to just play with it as an ex exercise and see how far can you go with it. Uh, it's a mind shift, uh, but I think that uh, it's actually worth the effort because it might change the way you think about writing code. It worked really great for me. Uh, I'm still using adamantium uh, in my, some of my open source libraries and in some places in, 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 uh, in my projects uh, uh, for my clients. Uh, however, it is slow, so uh, whenever I see that it slows down things too much, I would just uh, drop it. Uh, but the trick is that after a few months of writing code in this style, I actually so got used to it that I'm currently, I'm just unable to, to design something when objects are mutable. I just, my brain no, no longer works like that. I just create objects and they won't change. They, they don't expose an interface where uh, you could mutate them. I just mind shift, seriously. So. This is something that uh, is also related to convenience and simplicity because a mutable state is actually convenient because you don't have to think about, like, you don't have to make many decisions up front. Uh, you just create some objects and then later on in, run, in runtime, they may or may not change depending on the context. Maybe I will have to do something extra to set some instance variable or not. Uh, it's just more convenient. Uh, whereas objects that cannot change are less convenient. Uh, but you actually achieve uh, um, simplicity in your code. So it is worth the effort. I hi highly recommend that. Um, so the next part is about the relational model. This is a huge subject. Um, when we think about, when we talk about rela relational model, we usually think about relational databases. And the trick here is that it's not really about the databases. It's not really about SQL. Uh, because relational model is actually something that we can use to structure our data. And recently I read a paper called Out of the Tar Pit, uh, which, is, uh, which talks about uh, dealing with complexity. And one of the uh, biggest parts of this uh, paper is about relational model and how it can simplify uh, our systems. So the definition that they have is that the the relational model has, despite its origins, nothing intrinsically to do with databases. Rather, it is an elegant approach to structuring data, a means to man for manipulating such data, and a mechanism for maintaining integrity and consistency of state. Uh, so when we talk about relational model, uh, we actually talk about how we structure our data, uh, how our data should look like in our system. We're not talking about how it's gonna look like in the database. It's a separate concern. Uh, and also it gives us a way to uh, deal with the data in a, in a structured manner. So when it comes to Ruby and relational, relational model, we actually have some pretty awesome libraries. Um, so if, you wanna, if we wanna use relational model in, in Ruby, for example, we have a library called Axiom. Um, this is like the foundation for Ruby object mapper. And this library gives us uh, an implementation of relational algebra. And with Axiom, you can define relations. And uh, as Lucas said yesterday during his talk, relations are just uh, sets with tuples and nothing else. It's, it's a really, really simple concept. And when we want to define a structure of a relation, we simply define its header. And a header just defines what attributes a relation has and what data, data types we use. So then we have a, uh, an interface for a manipulation. Um, so, for example, if we have relations, users, and tasks, we can simply insert data into those relations. Uh, and by the way, uh, this, this is immutable, so users.insert returns a new instance of user relations, so the previous one is not being changed. Um, then we can uh, use relational operations in order to create other rel relations. Uh, so we have things like join, rename, restrict, project, all this stuff is there. 
uh, and then we can simply access data. So this is a really simple concept. You just have a set of tuples, nothing else, and a bunch of methods that you can use in order to manipulate the data and, and access the data. Uh, one of an interesting things, uh, one of the interesting things is that you can actually do some crazy stuff like join two relations and then insert data into those relations and Axiom will actually distribute, if, we, if you are using uh, an SQL database and you have two tables, it will actually distribute the rights to uh, the insert methods, uh, sorry, in insert statements into separate tables. So this is pretty cool. And it's because there is this concept of data independence in relational model and which says that it is a clear separation that is enforced between the logical data and its physical representation. Um, so this is pretty much what, uh, what uh, Ruby Object Mapper is doing. Uh, we have a logical structure of our relations that we define in our application level, uh, and the way it is actually stored in the database is something completely, so completely different handled by a separate layer. Um, Axiom handle, handle, handles that uh, by using adapters for, for databases. So, a really huge uh, concept that we're experimenting with is using relations as uh, first-class citizens. Uh, it, is it is an interesting concept, and what we usually do these days in Ruby, at least, uh, is that most of the ORMs are using active record pattern. So, like the, the, the first class citizen in our, in our system is, is, is a model, right? It is a class that gives us a query interface. So we have this model and we run some queries to get the data. And even though, uh, for example, here we have a scope uh, called active, uh, so if we use the, the, the query interface of, of active record, we, we do get a relation back although the relation is not the, the first class citizen in our, in our system, the model is, and the instances, instances of, of this model also uh, work as, as, as the first class uh, citizen in our uh, system. Uh, so the major difference in philosophy here is that we would like to put relations in front. Uh, and when I say relations, I simply mean the data, right? Because relations is just data. So like the most basic implementation would be to have a relation registry uh, where internally we define relations that we need in order to build other relations that we will expose publicly for our application. So we, th we don't think about running queries in our application, we're thinking about the data, we're thinking about what data do we need uh, and how it is being fetched from the database is just completely, completely a separate concern. So here we just create a relation registry and we have access to active users. And active users uh, is a relation that is the first class citizen in our system and is just data. Um, so the reason why uh, this concept um, is, uh, well, at least should be better, is that we achieve better composability and better, better encapsulation. Uh, and by composability, I mean, uh, if we're using uh, relations and just relations, we can combine them, compose them to create other relations. And the order in which we are doing that is, is just not important. And not relying on order is one of the things that we should do in order to reduce complexity. Uh, and another thing is, is encapsulation. Uh, when we are using relations, we're talking about the data. We're talking about what data we need. We're not talking about how we fetch the data. Um, so that's, that's a huge difference. Uh, so if we take a look at, a, at an example where we wanna find all the users without tasks. So we have users and they have tasks and we wanna find all the users with no tasks. So in active record we would like to use join but this won't work because this uh, produces an inner join. So we, what we need to do is to just uh, use an SQL, uh, a partial SQL and using a left outer join. Uh, yesterday we saw how we can do this with uh, ARIL, with uh, an object-oriented interface. Uh, but still, we are talking about running a query here. We are talking about details like uh, what kind of a join we should use, what kind of uh, keys we are using uh, in the on um, uh, clause, and all this stuff that is just specific for a database. 
Uh, and my experience is that when I'm working on uh, a bigger project where I have a lot of a lot of con um, a lot of um, uh, methods that return uh, query objects um, or scopes, we call them scopes. Uh, I simply lose confidence pretty quickly. Uh, I had many times I had a situation where it turned out at some point that all the crazy chaining that we did in some place of our system actually returns wrong data, which sometimes is not a big deal, but sometimes it can be a pretty huge bug. Uh, since we're exposing data that are, for example, uh, that, that should be, for example, uh, uh, hidden. So it's, it's, it's a big problem. And uh, when it comes to relations as first class citizen, the concept here is that we are not composing queries, we are composing relations. Uh, and I know that it, may sound, it might sound a little bit confusing for you since, as I said, active record query methods return relations as well. Uh, but we are still thinking in terms of queries, not in terms of relations. And the, the difference uh, is that when we combine relations, we use relational algebra to do that. So we use relational operators to do things. And it is, again, it is like basic uh, uh, set theory. We're just using basic operations on, on set that has some tuples, and that's it. So if we want to achieve the same thing, find all the users without task, we're just using the, dif the difference operator. Or something that even looks, looks nicer, just, just a alias, which is a minus. So we say all the users minus the ones with tasks, which obviously gives us users without tasks. Um, and the trick here is that all the relations if we are using an SQL database, we can translate all the relations uh, into an SQL query. Uh, currently, uh, the SQL generator in Axiom can do pretty much everything, although uh, performance is obviously a problem, so we're now working on uh, an optimizer that would make sure that we are running uh, uh, queries that are efficient. So, all those ideas, uh, we're trying to incorporate them within this project uh, called Ruby Object Mapper. I mentioned it before. Uh, it, start, it started as the second version of Data Mapper project, but eventually we, re we realized that it's just something completely new, so we decided to create a new project, give it a new name. Um, and also initially, we thought that we're gonna implement the Data Mapper pattern as described by Martin Fowler. Uh, however, recently we started thinking about doing some things differently, uh, like using relations as the first class citizen. So the major focus in the project is, is to focus on relations, uh, which means to focus on just the data. Um, this is our primary uh, concern right now, to, to uh, create an interface that gives you access to the data, which is as simple as possible, so that working with the data is just trivial. Um, and we also wanna, want to really achieve clear separation between the database structure and uh, your logical structure uh, that you have in your system. And another big part of, of Ruby Object Mapper is mapping to objects, uh, which is like the core one of the core parts of the data mapper pattern. So you have data in the database and then you wanna map the data to some objects. Um, so initially we, we thought that this is a huge thing uh, in, in the project, uh, but to be honest, right now we're thinking that, yes, yeah, sometimes we might wanna map things to something more sophisticated, but in many cases we can just use the data tuples and that's it. Um, so the next part is, is just simplicity. We're trying, to, uh, we're trying to narrow down the interfaces as much as possible. Uh, we want to have just one way of doing things, uh, which is a little bit against the Ruby philosophy, uh, but we just disagree with that. So uh, we're trying to have, uh, for example, for uh, things like creating data, we just want to have one interface. Uh, we don't want to uh, introduce uh, many interfaces just because we want to have uh, some optimiza optimization for, for a database, right? Uh, like um, in Active Record, you have methods like update attribute, update attributes, and other things that, that are there just because you sometimes want to, want to use them because of performance, right? Uh, so we're trying to avoid that and we're trying to, to move the optimization to, to a separate layer where uh, 
an efficient Q SQL query will be generated. Um, so when it comes to defining logical schema in Ruby Object Mapper, uh, this is pretty much a DSL on top of Axiom, which is, which is also uh, uh, following the philo philosophy where uh, we're focusing on building small tools that are then used by uh, some higher level tools that are just a simple wrappers uh, that simply uh, expose a DSL that is convenient, right? Uh, however, ROM itself is, is pretty that simple uh, internally. So in ROM, you can define relations uh, in a pretty, pretty similar way as you do with Axiom. And one of the ideas that we have right now is to have ability to define, to define which relations will be private, which means that they won't be accessible uh, within your app. Uh, they are only there in order to create other relations that you will um, expose for your app, uh, which we believe should, uh, should give better uh, encapsulation. So if you want to define uh, external, external relations or public relations, uh, you can ju just uh, define them uh, like that without passing uh, the uh, internal true argument. And you, you have access to all the relations that you defined before, and you can just combine them however you want using relational algebra operators. Uh, and then ROM will simply expose everything that you defined. So in your app, you won't be creating queries, you won't be writing uh, things that are tightly coupled to the structure of your database, you will be simply accessing the data. And important part here is that relations should be context aware, uh, which means that here we have a user's task relation, which returns all the tasks for a particular user. So our context here is that we need uh, the user ID. So uh, this is one of the requirements. Uh, and it will work like that. So you will simply pass in the user ID and you will get the data back. Um, so this is what we, and this is, this is the major difference because what we usually do is that this part here in, uh, inside this block, this is, this is what we would usually write inside our application, right? Like in a controller or, or somewhere else, right? Uh, it's, it's available, so we do that, uh, even though like the best practice is to use scopes, et cetera. Uh, but the truth is, if something is available, then you're going to use it, right? Because it's just, you know, it's simple, it's convenient, so you're going to just write it uh, without thinking too much about it. So this is like the major difference here. Um, so the, the next big part is, is mapping data to objects. But as I said, uh, we're kind of changing our minds, and, and right now we're thinking that map mapping is not such a big, uh, such an important feature. Uh, but it can be helpful, it can be just handy. So we, we, have, we have something like a mapping, uh, which is a way of defining how you want to map uh, relations to some other objects. So ROM will uh, create entity classes for you, and it, it, will, uh, it will just create a way of, of instantiating those, those entity classes using the data from, from relations. Uh, so this is an example of a basic attribute mapping. So it would generate um, it would generate a, um, a task entity, and it will uh, it will return entities like instances of this entity class uh, by using the attributes. Right. Uh, we also uh, support something like uh, using embedded values. Uh, so you will will be able to create aggregates. Uh, so here we ha we would have a task entity that has a title and it also has a user instance and it will like automatically generate those classes for you and um, and yeah because well, yeah one thing that I forgot to mention is that you uh, in data mapper pattern uh, you can't really have like dynamic things so in active record you do things like uh, user first and then I don't know dot tasks right uh, here you ha you have to define it up front because once you start accessing the data, it already needs to know what will be instantiated. And once it's instantiated, it doesn't have access to persistence layer because it's separated. Uh, so that's a, like a major difference between active record and data mapper approach. Um, yeah, so the last part is just simplicity. Uh, even though like the whole ROM project is uh, 
it is complicated because it's, it's, it's a lot of different problems. However, we are trying to, to solve them using separate libraries. So uh, we have Axiom, we have, we have Optimizer, uh, we have Morpher for mapping. Uh, all this stuff is there so that ROM will simply uh, use those tools and just expose a DSL on top of those uh, tools. So the focus is on simplicity, even though we have many, uh, many libraries involved. Uh, we are still trying to, to, to achieve a very consistent interface uh, so that it will be just simple to use. Um, so to wrap this up, uh, ROM will give you a way of accessing the data. You won't be uh, thinking in terms of relation, uh, sorry, in terms of queries, you, know, you won't be thinking about your database columns, whatever, you will be just accessing relations and you will define those relations inside your logical schema definition. Uh, it will give you a simple way of mapping the data to some other objects if you want that. However, we think that in many cases you will be happy with just the data. Uh, we will also want to have uh, a simple interface for uh, inserting data. So there's no point in creating, I don't know, a user instance in order to, 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 to save its data. Using a data hash is all you need. Uh, and we also want to support something like using the relations that you defined uh, to manipulate them. Uh, so you, for, you can, for example, join many relations um, as a context for, for uh, persisting uh, a nested data structure and the system will distribute the individual operations to, to, to separate tables for you. Um, yeah, so embrace simplicity and convenience can come later. You can always look at things later and, and see how we can simplify stuff from the point of view of, 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 of a user that this is using your interfaces. Uh, I don't think that focusing on convenience so much right from the start is, is a good strategy. Um, yeah, and that's it, thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, any questions for him? Uh, so, one question. Uh, I've been walking around and asking different companies and developers about how far they go with this uh, with approach you described, and most of you of them are pretty happy with uh, Active Record, and uh, they are maybe using additional use cases later, but. Uh, for all the stuff, they are happy. And do you have examples, and maybe you have your own experience when you should go that far with uh, separation of concerns when you develop uh, a web application? Uh, I haven't written any application uh, which would fully be uh, based on those concepts. Uh, I'm using some of those concepts in some places in my applications, and I'm really happy uh, with those. Uh, Martin, uh, one of the guys from, from the team, uh, is r right now working on an application where he's using all this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, he implemented most of it already uh, in a separate project. Uh, we're now collaborating together to, to, to get all this stuff into Ruby Object Mapper. Uh, and he's extremely happy with this approach. Uh, he's been working on this, uh, this application for a few months already. Uh, it's a lot of code already. Uh, and he's really confident that this approach uh, really leads to, 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 to just simplicity. Um, but yeah, as you said, many people are happy with Active Record. Many people are happy with the way Rails works. Uh, I'm not questioning that. Uh, Rails works for me in a lot of cases. Uh, I'm still happy uh, using Rails. Uh, something that I recently started doing was that I switched to SQL uh, without using its model uh, layer. I'm just using its query uh, interface. And, and I'm doing something like I showed you uh, in the slides. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found it to be really great. Um, I'm just focusing on, on, on the essential stuff and I'm, not, I'm just rejecting everything else. Uh, it feels good, but it's, it's, it's more work. Uh, it's, it's just more work because I need to write more code. Uh, but still, sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't, right? So depending on your context. Uh, but overall, I'm pretty confident that if your system is growing, uh, then eventually you will appreciate an approach where you're just focusing on simplicity and less on convenience. <laughs>
Okay, thank you. And uh, do you think it makes more sense uh, when you start to write a new application to start with your approach, or it's okay to start with regular regular Rails way and then trying to switch, trying to refactor? Um, I think that <laughs> depends, right? Uh, uh, if you're working on your own product and you got like better funding than you, then you can do whatever you want and it will probably be great. Uh, but usually uh, you don't have this situation. So right now I would just leverage the power of the tools that I have and, and, and worry about things later. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, right now we just don't have the tools that I described today. Uh, they are not as mature as, as Rails and its ecosystem. It's just not there yet, and it's going to take years to get there. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty pretty much experimental stuff. So building things on top of experimental software is obviously pricey. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. And the last question about Adamantium. Uh, have you tried to use it in while you develop and uh, uh, then turn it off when you publish Game, gem or no. Uh, application? No, uh, no, I haven't. Uh, in some of, of my projects, uh, I, I just use it and nobody complained. Uh, but I know that uh, Marcus, another guy from the team, uh, he had that use case. Uh, he used adamantium in his project and then he had to turn it off because it was too slow. Yeah. So the, uh, the slowness you told about is it is gone after you turn it off. Yeah? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Because you're not freezing everything deeply. Okay. Um, just a quick question. How do you handle validations? Like if you're just in general with the scheme? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm having something like a validator object. Uh, I'm currently I'm 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 just using uh, the active model stuff because that's that's the most powerful thing that exists right now. Uh, one of one of the team members um, uh, are wor I think he's still working on a library called uh, Vanguard, which is like a library dedicated for validations that is completely like separated from from everything. Uh, but there are still some some interesting uh, problems to solve, like like I don't know if your validation procedure requires a database connection, and what do you do, and things like that. Um, but yeah, in general, in general, I'm trying to use uh, database constraints for uh, for certain things and rely on that. Uh, you, right now, uh, Martin is using uh, the other guy. Uh, right now, he's using uh, an approach where uh, he's just relying on constraints and catching errors from the driver if something wasn't fetched, uh, sorry, wasn't uh, saved. He's just fetching error, error and producing a, an error message. He's doing that right now, and he's still not super confident about like the implementation details, but in general, he's like moving towards a different direction where it should work for him pretty well. Yeah. Since we're talking about re-implementing active model stuff, uh, are you mostly using this uh, to generate SQL query statements, or are you doing any like serializable stuff, like a JSON or anything with it? Uh, with what? With SQL? Uh, you're just like generating SQL queries or like statements. Or are you doing anything with like JSON or anything like that with it? Uh, no, I'm just using it for uh, for generating queries. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, if you guys have any questions after that, can uh, look for him because we're running a little bit short on time. Uh, thanks. Yep. Thank you.